Hello everyone. Welcome to the Lake Rejuvenation and Management course. This is a collaborative initiative by Bangalore University, Friends of Lakes, Biome and Atri. The purpose of this course is to educate citizens on lake rejuvenation, covering both engineering and environmental aspects. Happy learning. We can start the second half of the session. So our next speaker is Mr. Girish Pathisaldi. Good afternoon all. Just to start with, this is our introduction to our company. I am from Rohini Project Management Consultants. We are established in 2005. And we have been doing uh, many uh, different kind of projects. Uh, right from buildings to lake regeneration as well as uh, commercial hospitals, healthcare, everything. So, uh, today's topic uh, more focusing on the aspect that the construction sequence in building the lake assets. So, what we will be discussing today is going to be preparations that are required to start a project, then how different documentations that is uh, your DPR, GAN charts, BOM, schedule rates, they are being used or what are they exactly. The next is uh, typical work workflow and the material flow. That is how at site it will be managed. Then typical equipment and manpower skills that are used in a project. Then you have checks and the tests and as well as uh, I'll be showing you some uh, standard checklists which we uh, make use of during certain activities. Along with how the estimation of the material is done. And then you have uh, managing the site that is which is actually which is more related to the institution part of it. So there will be a storage and then there will be um, a site management which is getting involved. And as well as when you are executing, obviously we need to have quality checks. So these are the points which will be covered. Now straight away getting into this slide, which has been a standard slide for uh, quite a long time now. Uh, these are the lake assets what we uh, have uh, uh, listed out. Now we, we see all this as a separate finished products, right? So it doesn't happen or doesn't get constructed in the way how it has been listed out. It, this has to be sequenced. This also has to be broken down into activities. Now for doing all that, there is a lot of planning which has to go in. There has to be a lot of coordination with uh, the people, with the teams, with the contractor, with the authorities and as well as with once you deploy the site equipment there will be a lot of uh, site coordination which is getting involved so let's let's look into as an um, aspect try and understand what all is in our control and how we can establish that right so moving on to the next slide now when we are talking about a project you can consider it as a product or an end result. Now that has to be divided into three stages. How small or how big the asset might be or the entire project as such. You have to work from part to whole. You, you have a picture of the whole thing which is the end product or the end result. How you want to to happen or how it uh, has to be executed. So uh, looking into that aspect, we will have to divide that into three uh, stages that is pre-construction, during construction and post-construction. Let's see what all can be involved or how we can categorize all this. Now pre-construction mainly means collection of information. Now collection of information can result 
in uh, knowing the site information or as well as knowing the uh, geotechnical investigations what we carry out to understand the soil profile or uh, the subsoil conditions as well as uh, the available area and what needs to go in it because we, we, we saw the number of assets which can be put in. So there might be something more in that, something which you can uh, reduce it. It's not that every time you have a cycling track or you have a security game in there or you need to do uh, pathways or plant trees. It's, it's that again, you will have to uh, make the concept ready. Okay. So this is all working before the start of the project. Then as well as quality of the raw material, that will again, you need to have complete information on that aspect. And what adaptation of construction methodology we can. Now, this is going to ease your construction because everything would be pre planned. You can't be having something uh, which is not locally available or the lead time being more and getting into that. So, this you need to have a clear cut plan in place, which we call it as pre construction. During construction, that is when the work execution happens. That is, you test the material and as well as when the activities, when that assets are broken down into activities and then uh, broken down into small uh, uh, um, uh, small works, we need to check the quality of it at every stage during the construction. We'll see that, how do we do it. And as well as once uh, it is completed, then you need to carry out regular tests on stability and uh, if you have water uh, getting in and uh, quality of water and other components. Now this is very, uh, this slide, whatever you see, this is, it's, it's, it's a very common language, right? DPR, then you have BOM or BOQ, GFC, GAN chart, estimates. What does exactly this means? Just to, as a, as a common definition as a common person understand. We can say DPR is a document that explains the lay and the existing conditions and implements envisaged along with the concept design for the assets. Sometimes it can be detailed design also. Right? So we'll see what uh, in, in a brief what all can be covered in a DPR. There is something called as BOM or we call it as BOQ. That is BOM means Bill of Materials. It is mostly the specification of that particular activity. Then you have GFC drawings that is good for construction. That means you are ready to go for construction and uh, you can use that drawing as your um, uh, a drawing which you can go ahead and start doing the construction work, actual construction work. Can charts, then that is getting involved or that, that is a primary thing which is uh, there for detailed planning of the project. I'll show you the sample of that. Then we have estimate. Now what, what does the estimate carry? Uh, it, it carries the cost of the project uh, prepared or compared with schedule of rates. Right? So when we are talking about BOM, now who prepares the BOM? or the BOQ, for that the person who does it, he is called as a quantity surveyor, right? So uh, first let us see the BO, uh, BOM or the BOQ being a part of DPR. Now the entire DPR, this is uh, just I have listed out some of the things which can be included or rather is a minimal requirement for a preparation of a DPR. What, what does the DPR contain? It will contain survey of the present status of the lake, the causes of its deterioration, then authorized and unauthorized developments around the lake, the sources of pollution, you have quality of sewage coming to the lake and lake water, silt accumulated in the lake, activities carried out in the lake area and its surroundings, condition of the lake area, social impact and concerns, requirement of recreational 
uh, facilities around the lake. Now, uh, are you seeing how it is getting developed? First, you start getting the information about the lake. Then you talk about how, what are the uh, pollutants or what are the possible areas from where the lake is getting that there are, there are the sources, right? So that has to be addressed. Then what facilities you want when you regenerate a lake or you want to build a new uh, uh, um, assets in the lake. So requirements have to be frozen. Then you have methodology to adopt and improve the lake. Then uh, formulating the essential components required for revival and maintenance. And obviously, when we talk about all this financial implication for revival and its maintenance. So this is just a brief where you can say a DPR should contain, which will give you mostly an idea where the works uh, uh, needs, that needs to be carried out for that particular lake may not be <clears throat> the entire thing is applicable there. So what is applicable has to be captured in the DPR. Exactly if that is getting translated into a technical language. Now we, we are talking on a, a consultant uh, with a consultant background kind of a thing. We saw a general uh, terminology what is uh, required. So when we talk about exact scope, what does it involves the DPR? Then you, uh, you you are exactly talking about inspection of the lake, watershed area of the lake, and understand the causes and sources of pollution. Then you have the in situ measures uh, like desilting the lake. Then uh, you have to have uh, prevention of pollution from uh, point uh, construction of waste weir, sanitary facilities construction and strengthening of uh, bund, formations of jogging, track, walkway and as well as operation and maintenance for the uh, proposed project. So all this has to be sequenced, translated into activities. Only then this will be able to get the form of the asset what we think about. For Doing that, we need to actually understand the workflow, right? At the pre-construction stage, what, what happens? The workflow is, first is called as a design phase. Now, at the design phase, there is a collection of information. We saw the detail, right? There is survey, geotechnical data, and the areas, uh, uh, the surrounding area, all that. You need to collect the information. Then sizing and setting out, right? So, what exactly are you looking for that asset to cater to how many people? What is your uh, 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 population which you are planning for? Then you need to devise a concept plan. Then you get into detailed design of each asset. Right? Then you have a, uh, when, when you are done with the concept plan and you go into the detailed design of each asset, you also have to quantify. Now, quantifying essentially means it has to have a bill of quantities that is called as bill of quantities. Along with it, you need to have an estimate. That's what we call as a budget for the project. Now, what does a BOQ contain for? BOQ contains detailed quantification of items for each asset setting the specifications and expectations and budget the cost. Now, setting the specification and expectation, what does it mean? You are giving the technical specifications for that particular activity being carried out. We are, we are not now not thinking the entire thing as an asset. We have to build the asset considering it is being broken down into separate smaller uh, uh, activities. Now, if you consider a bund, what does bund exactly consist of? It is with a soil, right? So, for uh, directly you can't start constructing the bund. You need to clean the surface, then you need to test the soil condition. So, there has to be a sequence. We will come to that also. 
in the forthcoming slides. So all that can happen when you give the very clear cut guidelines for the contractor to understand what is the specification set and as well as what are the expectations. Expectations are normally complying with the Indian standards, what we call as IS. And also you have to have a budget to it. Then all that will come into picture, uh, whether it is happening inside the budget, overruns and all that. We are, we are not getting into that part of it. But this is, we are only talking about the basic plan as on, as on date, right? Once the uh, budget is done, BOQ is done, it is all completed. Then we call it as a preparation of detailed drawings. Detailed drawing means GSC drawings, that is execution drawings. Once you are done with your concept, which uh, will give you the basic planning on the sizes and what assets and the uh, location where you are planning, all that happens, then suitable execution drawings based on the soil conditions and uh, the client requirements or the stakeholder requirement, let us say, uh, it, the, you have to detail the drawings. So that is what we call it, call it as preparation of execution drawings. Then comes the major uh, part on the execution, right? For execution, first you need to pre-qualify the contractors. Pre-qualification essentially means that it is not open for all the contractors you have to have a minimal criteria that is all mentioned in the tender when uh, uh, there is a tender being floated so uh, the contractor should have so much of experience this much of uh, um, engineers they have to deploy there has to be a requirement of uh, uh, so much equipments for this project so there are different criteria based on the resources, based on his turnover, based on the timeline and based on the contractor's availability, right? So based on all these factors, we pre-qualify the contractors. Then for the pre-qualified contractors, there are tenders being floated. You have the negotiations, then you do the finalizing the contractor, right? So, uh, when we talk about BOQ, we will just understand, this is just as a, uh, some more uh, additional information, we, we need a quantity surveyor. What does a quantity surveyor uh, does? What are his functions? So, basically, he is a person who manage and controls the cost within the construction projects. He does the measurements. This is during, uh, pre, during and as well as at the post, right? Pre means estimate, during means while well, during the execution, where, uh, do, uh, for doing the building. It's not that it's the same quantity surveyor who does it. It will be, uh, the name is quantity surveyor, but it will be done by different stakeholder. First, uh, estimation might be done by uh, the party who is going to take up the work. The contractor will do at the time of execution, right? Then you have estimations. The quantity surveyor is also responsible for the costing, even for the valuation, for filling the tender and ensuring that there is cost is minimized and the value is enhanced uh, for the project. So how does measurements happen? Just to give you an insight on that, each asset is broken down into uh, construction material uh, wise. Now, if you take, uh, let us say, uh, as a silt trap, silt trap can be made with concrete, right? So, it's not direct concrete. You have to do excavation. Then you have to do the base formation. Then you have the steel. Then you have shuttering. Then you have concrete. So, these are all the construction material or construction uh, uh, activities which are already 
listed in the bill of quantities right so that measurements will be quantified by this quantity survey so that is when it will be called as a bill of quantities each asset will be broken down and uh, i have shown uh, just as an indicative format for example you have uh, serial number then you have description of work you have unit it might be in square meter cubic meter uh, running meter then you have the numbers then you have length breadth the depth height you have the calculate uh, quantity to be calculated and you have any remarks you can do so such detailed measurement sheets of each activity is prepared then it is subtotal for that particular uh, similar specification and for that you have a technical spec which is written and you take a rate for that that is then accumulation of all such small 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 uh, activities or uh, description of works is called as bill of quantities then you have the uh, what what does the quantity surveyor does the next is the cost of uh, building the raw material in the finished asset is calculated okay that is what is called as an estimate once the bill of quantity is done then it has to be moved on to the cost part of it the contractor will quote for it right then you have the rates uh, for some then it's not that every time the entire uh, um, uh, things can be captured in the bill of quantities or based on the site conditions there might be certain additional items which will uh, creep in so that has to be analyzed all that is a function of a quantity survey then contractor should and will claim the measurements in line of uh, with the drawings and actual works right so basically you have everything measured a quantity surveyor is a vital or an integral part of the entire operation because he is the one who is going to take through the project in measurement points so you do you know exactly how much is the thing gone in it or how much is executed the numbers that's what it matters right that's why we can easily say that the final quantity and cost does arrive are called boq and estimate and us is a vital during pre uh, during and uh, post construction stages right so uh, this is one of the asset i'm talking about the asset for the uh, manpower asset where the uh, the work needs to be carried out uh, and he would be responsible for that now let's move on to uh, one more aspect where we talk about planning now planning when we when we are talking about can charts right just to give you an insight on what what exactly that means is for this or sequence description of all the activities we have already seen that right we break down each asset into a stage how it will be sequenced and how it will be built for that particular type and this projecting it on the paper is called as project planning you have two methods to do it so uh, what we call uh, display technique is an uh, milestone chart uh, the types is milestone chart can chart task list then you have network diagram 2d analyzing is critical path critical chain per resource leveling and schedule acceleration so what we focus is mainly on the can chart now can chart is something like this right coming back to what exactly we were talking about right you have the entire list broken down now for example uh, you you can see this right preparatory works by the contractor you have site mobilization deployment of machinery then marking of the, the fund and the foot over bridge then trial mix so basically we are breaking down the direct or indirect activities 
for building that asset and we are supposed to give a duration to it. This is all getting planned. We are talking at pre, right? So this is very vital. Please understand this. Every aspect, every aspect, you have to have such Gantt charts, Microsoft project. That's what we do to, uh, in all our, uh, across all our projects. So the thing is, if, if you uh, consider one asset, for that you need to first get the drawings, then uh, mobilize the resources for that, and then you get into building it. Building it again, you have to break down that activity. So everything is broken down. You have a planned start and planned finish. Once the contractor is on board, it will become baseline start and baseline finish, right? The, so the baseline is frozen. Once the execution starts, then we start seeing it as actual start and actual finish. You have a percentage complete to that and a, um, a percentage work complete. There might be certain activities which, uh, uh, you know, for example, you can see activity number uh, 23. Okay. It was not complete. So we have just said 50% of that work being completed. So this way we can monitor the project. And in case there is a disconnect between the baseline and the actual. So that is being also being projected. Right. So this is a very vital tool on the planning aspect. BOQ is something which is for the estimate. Quantity surveyor is a, a main person handling that. This is related to planning. Now, continuing on the workflow for the construction. Once the uh, contractor is been finalized, right? We 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 left it there, right? Once the contract the contract is finalized, then the contractor has to mobilize to site. So then the handing over of site will happen. Then, then joint recording of conditions uh, and levels, right, of the entire area, whatever is the initial levels, what conditions it is, so that will be done. Then fixing the look ahead plan, we saw it in the planning, right, so what, what, what next, basically whenever there is work happening, the question should be what next, rather than uh, we, are, we, we, we wait till uh, see what is going to happen, right? What next to be the question and we have to plan it. Plan it earlier than the contractor for uh, him to be guided properly, right? That what means agreeing on the sequence of operation, right? This is all we are still talking about mobilization and all. Now the actual work starts, which is of entirely contractor based that is execution he will be responsible to prepare the construction methodology for each asset then uh, the monitoring has to happen right the field execution by the contractors then uh, quality of material and safety checks testing and commissioning then maintaining uh, daily records certification of bills as per IS and approval of stakeholders. So basically why I am giving you those construction flow is all this before anyone hits the site right to start the work. All this has to be done. It is very very important. So if in case so much work is already planned then there will not be uh, surprise uh, surprises during the execution, may it be uh, we don't have a budget to do it or we are not able to complete the work because of uh, unforeseen reasons, it might be resources uh, which were not planned properly or uh, let us say uh, there was not so many people mobilized. So there will be a lot of things which will not be in control. So knowing all this. We should be having all this plan in picture, right? So if, even after this, the projects mostly 
will not be completed on time. Let's uh, look into a typical sequence, right? Now this table will give you uh, an understanding on a typical sequence when we start the work. Now let us say uh, for cleaning of site, the equipments used, what the equipments uh, you can use. You can use a JCB, you can use a pork lane, tipper, tractor, every, uh, many other equipments, right? So test what is recommended. Okay, you, you need to have a visual inspection test that whether the site is uh, clean or not, right? Then you have a setting up of site office. So this is, uh, I have tried and built up uh, as a standard uh, sequence. How, when you approach a lake, when you start the lake work, how it will be done. Now you set up a site office. Obviously there will be engineers who is going to work there. There will be people who will, will be uh, staying there for uh, most of the time in the day. So you need to have a site office for keeping records, for having daily meetings and all for the engineers to stay there, right? So you have a site office. You need to have a soil testing. Now soil testing, the equipment what we can use is uh, we, we had a detailed section last time, right? So I'm just uh, running this fast. We have a sampler, auger board. You can take a disturbed or an undisturbed sample. Then remarks, uh, you can look into that. It, it's, it might be with a pre prescribed location or a random location. We saw the soil testing pattern also, right, last time. Uh, then the major thing when you talk about execution, it comes is the uh, dewatering. When you talk about dewatering, you need to see whether it can happen through a natural slope or else you need to have uh, intervention of uh, machines uh, pumping or you can make some exits uh, you can use JCB, Poplin, anything so basically you need to ensure that the lake is dewatered to start the next operation it might be desledging or desilting that way right then in between in between we need to have a survey done again we are talking about to have the levels recorded now uh, there is modern technology you can use drone also so there are companies who uh, provide these services who can just uh, uh, obviously it's, it's going to be costly and you will not be able to uh, compare to other ways of doing it uh, drone or uh, drone would be the costliest they have a total station and you can take it uh, using dumpy level so you need to have all the reduced level so there is a level sheet which will be uh, done so that is an output when you do the survey then you actually start the work of desledging uh, with your uh, construction equipment once that is done then you need to mark your assets again the surveyor comes into picture for this it is always better to use a total station for setting out you need to have a benchmark and benchmark is nothing but actually a point which is undisturbed and kind of a permanent thing which is which uh, which can be uh, built or which is already pre-existing and we already know or we, uh, that will not be disturbed kind of a thing okay uh, that is uh, called as a benchmark then you start uh, your burnt construction then your seal trap waste wear inlet and outlet so you have diversion of uh, sewage line. Once you start constructing the bund, you need to cut the slope for the bund. Then you have the pitching, right? Then you have the top layer, which can be done. Then you have planting of vegetation and so on and so forth. So this is uh, a typical sequence. This has to be detailed out. Uh, because of the shortage of time, I will not be able to get into breaking this down into activities. But I will just give you an uh, insight on looking into as a bund, as an uh, taking a bund as an example, how we can uh, do it, right? Just to understand what exactly we, we do, it, we will just run through or refresh our memories on uh, the components of a bund or a dam, right? So. What you see one, this is called as a foundation. You have a cutoff, right? It, 
this is a typical section. This may be done as per, obviously this should be designed as per the site requirement and the height, all that. But this is what is called as in common language, all this is going to be an integral part, right? So you have a blanket, then you have a core, core is uh, the uh, uh, main central portion of the bunt. Then you have uh, filters, shells, then freeboard is something uh, what we call as uh, the maximum water level and above that you need to have this uh, free space that is called as a freeboard. Then you have riprap that is a, a stone pitching and the crest or the pathway. We have uh, uh, totally uh, four types which can be classified into. One is gravity which is mostly used, uh, built, used concrete and rubble masonry. Arch is uh, uh, mostly built using concrete. Buttress is concrete and also timber and steel. Embankment is what we are concentrating for lakes, that is earth or rock, right? So, uh, uh, we, we basically call it as embankment. So, I'm, I'm just uh, telling you the bigger uh, picture of the whole the book and then getting it to concentrating what we are looking at. We are basically looking at embankment. So, for all this you need to have a strong foundation obviously and uh, bearing capacity we need to have a good bearing capacity else you need to improve that uh, subsoil conditions to uh, found the bunt and then you need to have uh, uh, low hydraulic conductivity. Right. So, uh, just to give you an insight on the design aspect, everything is done as per design. Why I am telling you this is there might be situations where side decisions might be taken. Okay, but it can't be taken offhand. It has to be done with a technical background. And it has to be done by an appropriate or a uh, person or an authority who is normally a consultant, right? If, if we talk about uh, top width of uh, an uh, earth fill dam or an embankment, so these are the formulas, H being the height, right? So I will not go ahead and explain the formula, but there is this is all recorded, right? So you need to see that this has to come from an consultant, not often uh, discuss and uh, see it as, as a, it's, it's already done as such, right? Later on, there would be troubles uh, uh, running through because if this is not followed. So these are the different types of uh, earthen uh, dams. Now what I was talking about is on the even the slope, right? So uh, considering the type of the soil, okay, there is a slope also which is already mentioned in IS. We can't be going anything different than this. Okay, this is just giving you a glimpse of it, type of soil upstream and downstream slope. You can, uh, for let us say for homogeneous well graded soil it is 2.5 is to 1 and downstream it can be 2 is to 1. So uh, we, are, we are talking about this being the downstream and this being the upstream side. Okay, so getting into and uh, taking a physical example of uh, construction of a burn, right? No. We see this common side, right? Uh, so what, what happens here is we have to start building this in layers, right? And use an appropriate equipment to compact it. Now, a bund is a trapezoidal. Now, it ha but you cannot exactly construct it as a trapezoidal. You have to construct something more and then cut it. You are seeing the second photo where 
the slope is being cut so the bund is be the bund is built in layers it's compacted and then it is been cut to the required slope using machines then you have the stone pitching for the entire length or wherever the consultant has prescribed up to the free board level so we will we'll, uh, get into a bit more of uh, detail of construction methodology of a bund right so what what exactly we do is first we i am talking about uh, think we, we we have done the survey the land is cleared then what needs to be done first inspect and test the surface of the proposed location of the bund so you need to take soil sample look into the bearing capacity <clears throat> and uh, do the test. Now, what test? How it will be carried out? In future slides, we will uh, look into. Uh, I can't run uh, the construction and the tests uh, together. I will run the tests separately that we will explain it to you. So, uh, once you inspect and test the surface, let us say the test passes, then we start building the bund. Now, how the building bund happens is it has to be built in layers and layers should not exceed more than 200 to 300 mm and it has to be compacted then layers what does it mean by 200 to 300 mm layers is you are talking about the compacted thickness so you need to have maybe something on an average 400 to 500 mm of soil which can be a dump spread and then you have the compactor which can be a vibro roller or a normal roller depending on the site uh, situation the compacting, uh, compacting machine will run through it so basically each layer not exceeding 200 to 300 when you are finishing it so after that you need to test it again Okay, now for that also, you are uh, required to ensure that the basic soil which you uh, use for construction of the bund is again tested, right? We saw many other uh, uh, soils, right? Many soils uh, which uh, gave us uh, different kind of compactions and uh, what, what can be used, what can't be used. Uh, something like you know well graded soil uniformly graded soil we have gap graded soil so you need to ensure all this the, all this is not visible to the physical you know to the naked eye if there are tests when you carry out the test automatically you will get the results those results will guide you whether it is compacted or not now what what uh, what do we mean exactly by uh, soil is being compacted. Soil compaction, it can be achieved using static or dynamic force and manipulation of soil. Static force make use of dead weight of machines to apply downward, right? But the dynamic force use, uh, they, 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 they vibrate, you know, you, you must have heard a vibro roller, right? So it is a kind of uh, vibration which, said, which is sent the roller goes you have uh, you touch the roller also you get a kind of uh, a vibration or a static roller it's, it's a normal roller so vibra vibro roller is the more preferred normally uh, the compaction is also better there. so the next question uh, what is generally asked is what is 95 percent compaction right we must have heard 95%, we have not achieved 95%. What, what does exactly that mean? That means to a uh, uh, technical uh, term is, we are talking about the 95% compaction. It means it has been compacted to the maximum uh, percentage, percentage of uh, density of the soil, right? So that is called as 95%. So maximum dry density with optimum moisture content. That is determined in laboratory. 
and that is being used as a, in the field. Okay, so we have to target normally ninety five percent. That is when you are able to tell whether the soil layer is compacted or not properly. Now, for doing that, there are uh, different tests. Uh, proctor test is there, which is a common uh, test. We'll see what that is. As I was telling you, there are different types of soil. Now, for uh, compaction, what material you are using, right? That depends how much compacting capability it has got. You use gravel. It has got high permeability. Foundation support is excellent. Pavement upgrade excellent. Expansive no compaction very easy. The same way if you go for uh, organic, which is obviously not uh, uh, not to be used, but I'm just giving you the bandwidth where you can compare. So this is the filler material. Now if you consider this on uh, sieves, this is how it will look like, right? So similarly, we need to choose the correct uh, machinery also. Now there would be different kind of machinery: rammers, wire ram axe. So for the which soil, what is recommended? I have just given you a snapshot here. So you use uh, vibratory rollers. For granular soil, it is not recommended. For sand and clay, it is the best application. Okay. So similarly, this is how we understand the equipment better. And using the right kind of equipment will give you better results. Now, for looking into the burn construction itself, as I told you, everything is already been designed and there are codes this just to give you an insight what codes are already available for every kind of but we can refer to all this criteria for design of small embankment ones then you have for a slope also, you have an IS code for a drainage system and rock fill, but also you have an IS code. So, there are uh, so many IS codes which are already written, written and in place. A designer uses all this to do the design. So, guideline for freeboard requirement for embankment dams. This is the IS code. Okay, you can see these references are uh, you know 95. 93, 94. So, since long time we do have it. This has to be used correctly and uh, has to be executed. Now comes the actual execution, right? So, we have to set a, a correct guideline to the contractor. Now, what uh, a contractor needs to be uh, needs to do when he comes to the site, right? When you see the site, you need to do again, you start doing the minimal planning. That planning would consist of site location and uh, surrounding. That need uh, surrounding needs to be studied. Local condition site uh, related. I mean, uh, there is uh, how, how it can, uh, the vehicles can move, all that needs to be seen. Then you need to have a proper uh, dumping yard and then if you have a sludge removal, the sledging which needs to be carried out, approval for that needs to be taken by the authority which can be done, where, where it can be done. So that is also a vital thing. Then uh, within the site, way of movement of construction equipment, for that you need to have an internal road system which will guide uh, vehicles, it might be tippers, it might be uh, poke lanes and all that. Uh, you have need to have ingress and egress. Then you have to have a perfect or a planned material storage yard. For building a bund, you need to have soil. Then for building pitching and all that, you need to have stone. You need to have a cement. So steel yard. All this has to be planned before you start actual work. This will give you an organized way of working. You need to have space for dewatering. Commencement of work is in which direction? Uh, 
I mean to say, uh, which is the start point of the work. Obviously, you cannot start near the gate, right? You have to start from the uh, far end and then come. But then you can work in parallel, right? If if, if the you have space, you have equipment. Again, based on the resources, you can commence the work in two directions, approach towards the road and complete the work in a much faster way. With all this, you need to have side barricading and security. Then you have uh, a restriction on permit to night works. When you talk about night work, you need to have lighting, you need to have a site office. Site, only you need to have a quality testing lab, you need to have a, a curing tank. And with uh, the point number 15, uh, equipment washing bay. This is what uh, we as a PMC always uh, advocate because when we talk about lake, there is a lot of uh, soil and things which, which get into the construction equipment. And when it is coming out of the site for going towards the dumping yard or for any other matter, the roads are also getting spoiled. So instead, we can uh, try and create uh, being an equipment washing bay. Just wash the tire. It is also good for maintenance of the machineries, right? So uh, this I'm just running through. So all the soil tests, these are all the lab tests which we uh, do it. A field test when we talk about is uh, your field density testing methods. We have a sand cone, balloon tensometer, all this. Uh, we will not look into how it is being conducted. That's not the criteria. This is only to under make you understand that there are uh, uh, ways to test each layer which can be done. Right. So if you use a sand cone method, the cost is going to be the lowest and likewise it increases. Now if you want to have a hand test, it is a quick method uh, just to understand whether the moisture density, uh, how it can be calculated. So you need to just squeeze it then uh, this, is, this is what we do it but uh, we, we, we have never thought about it, right? So if it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it, the soil is plastic uh, kind of thing, then when you leave it, then it, it will leave small traces uh, and uh, moist your fingers also. So likewise, when the soil is dry, it will uh, get uh, shattered and it will drop. So that is how uh, you conduct a uh, hand test. These are some uh, um, popular uh, ways of uh, doing the concrete test, mandatory test. Okay, this is a slum cone. It's a universal testing machine. You test the cube. This is the pulse velocity, a rebound hammer. It's a non-destructive test. So we will get into uh, a detail of how a compaction is done for a fund and what exactly we need to do to understand uh, moving forward for a construction of a fund. First, as we said, we need to survey it. Then you have in a submission of any approvals required, temporary road diversion if required. Then you need to have routes for transportation for temporary access we discussed about this, provide adequate plant and equipment to carry out the activities. Now, uh, wherever crossing the water courses, install temporary steel pipe. Uh, these are all just the guideline, right? So basically, when we talk about compaction, these are the main points. You have some uh, thing which you need to do it inevitably, which we call it as preliminaries. Then we get into site clearing and demolition if there are anything, uh, then you go for soil sampling, right? Soil sampling, I have just showed you the methods how it will be done. Uh, more what we need to concentrate is a trial embankment. Okay, this is, I am talking about a typical way of doing it. If it is done, it is better. It would be really good to understand the actual work, how it will be carried out in a mass uh, uh, way, right? A trial embankment is you need to actually construct as a length, as, as we call it as a sample, right? So for trial uh, purpose, whatever soil you are proposing, whatever soil is got to site, with that you need to 
compare, uh, start compacting as per the requirement 200 to 300 layers test it then you uh, test it that is what we call mm -hmm. the density test this will be done again you can understand how many passes it will be uh, uh, required for uh, for that particular equipment which is in place to pass the results right so trial amendment is a, a proposed method it is better that if it is used then you will uh, be able to predict uh, the exact or near to exact timeline to complete the entire work along with the resources being planned so similarly the slopes when it is being cut are you able to cut it in a proper way how it will be done all that uh, can be looked into practically now uh, backfilling materials we have uh, just looked into that uh, uh, determining the moisture content and the compaction level so the different tests are carried out before backfilling then replacement of suitable uh, unsuitable material so this is what is uh, uh, again which we need to focus on when there is test being carried out and in case there is failures right so instead of waiting till the time that the uh, portion of the work is carried out you can carry out trial pits okay trial pits can be carried out you can look into as a uh, smaller uh, lens where the work is already done whether it is satisfying the conditions else this has to be the layer has to be scraped and reworked right so that is what we are uh, talking about when there is uh, subsoil uh, water there are different methods to use and uh, we can uh, uh, backfill it now uh, when we are talking about embankment filling now we, we saw the test you know you, you are supposed to carry out the field density test okay vital thing is if the layer passes right then you can proceed with the next layer else you have to go back and redo the compaction now for redoing the same layer compaction you have different methods maybe you can just remove the top 100 mm layer blend it with the new uh, material and again continue with normal backfilling but again you need to test it right so testing of that uh, particular construction material has to be very much neatly done without any stoppage right so uh, this will be in uh, cyclic process which has to be carried out and has to be carried out for all the layers so coming on to uh, let us say a conclusion kind of a thing you know we are talking about integration of a lot of things here okay you have construction equipment that's basically the resources construction equipment material you have contractor staff everything right so exactly you need to have suitable construction equipment you have to have uh, compaction uh, uh, machines the manpower has to be skilled unskilled you, for each asset for bund and all you need to have uh, machineries and for building uh, uh, some uh, construction it has to be masons for fabrication it will be fabricators then you have electricians plumbers all that now for monitoring all this you need to have a uh, correct contractor staff right so which will contain of project manager engineer supervisor machine operators skilled and unskilled people everyone now when we talk about having an agency in between the stakeholder and the contractor we it is always recommended to have a project management consultant who will who can function doing all this and many more things because the vital thing is integration of multiple activities and resources 
now there will be situations where the sequence has to be set the timeline matters okay it will also have to monitor the cost then you have to do the tests so all this can be monitored by a project management consultant now we'll just run through what exactly uh, the contractor uh, needs to perform is each activity to be divided in form of activities each activity will have a different checklist then uh, checklist will be recorded and signed off checklist will be divided for pre during and post monitoring uh, agency will bring the deviations in terms of finishing quality etc to contractor uh, notice now just to uh, i am just breaking it down we are talking about checklists here okay so i'll just share you one sam sample checklist yeah okay when we talk about checklist okay so there has to be activity checklists which will be carried out now this is a typical checklist what we use in projects we have the name of the project client and all that then we have when we this checklist is actually uh, we are talking about ex excavation i'm giving you an example of excavation now for every activity there has to be pre during and post this is pre pre means record before commencement of excavation you have uh, the this is uh, what we use as a uh, this dumpy level where we calculate the reduced levels and with reference to the benchmark and on this is maintained in form of a data right before starting the excavation so this will give you a guidance level before the contractor actually starts the work similarly as you move further if there is a earth work which is happening other than rock so you you have a lot of things which has to be answered right whether there is crossings uh, submission then verification of uh, ground levels the grades so uh, we will not get into the detail i'm just showing you everything is to be recorded okay this is a sequence this has to be followed only then the work whatever can happen can happen in a more organized way so similarly you get into earth work so this is uh, during right when the work is happening how it is happening is there any observations which can be recorded or the corrective actions which can be done so there is a sign of the client representative or the project management consultant contractor will also accept it and as well rectify that then once that is done <coughs> you have uh, something for after also right so you need to take the level whether uh, it ha it has reached the exact levels uh, exact level i mean to say like the control line or uh, uh, ngl the foundation level the depth of excavation so size of excavation is it as per the drawing so all this needs to be recorded similarly every activity as you see so this is before so every activity we will develop such checklist okay so during after we'll have this now along with this what i want uh, you to uh, look at to is this is something what we call as a daily progress report now daily progress report also has to be made by the contractor along with the site people now this will give you what is planned a wbs is work breakdown structure what we saw in the gantt chart so there is a unique code which is uh, mentioned there so you will have the weather condition you have uh, what activity what is the unit what is the quantity in uh, now for example ex excavation it will be in cubic meter quantity in bo cube now 
planned quantity then cumulative planned then quantity executed cumulative quantity executed so what you are planning for the day now how much is it with reference to the bop quantity how much is actually executed by end of the day that is again calculated and how much is it uh, percentage with respect to the cumulative plan so plan versus actually you have the percentage if there is any shortfall now what shortfall how it will be mitigated so all this so what are the resources is used is used jcb tippers batching plant vibration compressors dewatering pump the other materials what is used so this will all give you a clear cut picture on how the contractor will maintain the record and you can again easily fall back in case of any uh, discussions or uh, uh, as we call disputes right so coming back to uh, this thing so as we saw in the checklist we we uh, tell them it has to be rectified again it will be tested and okay contractor will submit daily reports we saw that similarly we have weekly and monthly reports also i'll just show you that format also yeah so this is a typical uh, report i'll not get into the detail i'm just showing you the summary this will give you <coughs> the entire project uh, summary what it means uh, what uh, the summary will actually contain the who is the architect all the details so project type plans then you have the highlights and the major decisions this is on monthly basis then you have the design and statutory approval and status design procurement construction progress then the key milestone and the construction progress achieved for financial you have to have uh, the financial status bill payment status variation cash flow statement and the forecast right so this is what we cover in the monthly report right so looking into all this i would uh, sincerely say that in case in case there has to be an asset being built it has to be divided into activities each activity is already well documented well tested and has been specified in the construction language so all this checklist and the, the raw materials are very vital to look into the way how it can be executed now putting all this into together that it will take a final form of a, of the asset right so based on this when there is an execution being happening it is always required that there is a monitoring agency also the monitoring agency we call it as project management consultant which is very vital and uh, this is uh, our uh, perception that they are very much required for the project to ensure the project is being done in the specified or the timeline in the way how it has to be executed sequenced and as well as complying with the specifications what has been already laid that is a technical authority who will guide the entire project from start to finish yeah hope uh, we have covered this so next uh, we have mr vishwanath from biome solutions to deliver the closing keynote address to the lake course thanks shashank thanks aparna hopefully all the participants also would have enjoyed the whole course and uh, would have come till here okay so i'll keep it sweet and short but i'll also sort of discuss uh, what uh, according to me and in my personal experience of being working with water and water systems for the last 35 years some of the key ideas and challenges that i have found in the 
maintenance of what is essentially tanks, which are human-made structures, right? So I just want to uh, urge you, you have looked through the Eleanor Ostrom principles, sharing it as the commons. So I just point you to look at a tank system or a lake ecosystem through this six lens of sustainability, which is really uh, one of my ways of looking at this system. And that's called the stifle model. It's a social lens. Let's put a social lens on it. I'm sure that it's been discussed with it. Let's put the technical lens. It was discussed in great detail. The institutional lens, the governance lens, that is. The financial lens. How would the finances be sustainable? And that's really crucial, both in terms of capital investment, but also operations maintenance. The legal ecosystem, the legal sustainability. How is the legal protection given to the lake and to the entire ecosystem? And lastly, as a consequence of the social, technical, institutional, financial, and legal, you'll get environmental sustainability. So this six lens model is a good way to look at uh, the lake and tank ecosystem, according to me. The history of the tanks, which is the lake ecosystem, is really old. This is from Bangalore and the inscription stones of Bangalore. And my friend R.L. Uday Kumar, who works a lot on it, has uh, put up this poster and has given it to me to use it. Notice that Agara, one of the lakes in Bangalore, is dated to 870 AD. 1,200 years old uh, is the history of the tank, right? And before project management, before uh, vibratory rollers and before um, Gantt charts came into picture, uh, our ancestors were uh, managing water, understanding water 1,200 years back and trying to harness it to enhance the environment. And so that's the kind of legacy we have to continue. Also, some legacies which have impacted the tank and lake ecosystem. One of them in Bangalore has been the famine. Three years of famine in 1876 to 78 rendered all the magnificent thousand lakes of Bangalore dry. All the thousand tanks went dry, the wells went dry, and more than 100,000 people died in the city alone. And that's when the city forefathers said that the tank system perhaps is not sufficient to become reliable water suppliers. Mind you, this was not even pipe water supply. You were just going to the tank and drawing water. That this was no longer reliable if drought hit us for three years continuously, right? This sort of scenes really did uh, affect them. And so therefore, they moved to a river. So the shift from the tank and lake as a system to depend upon for drinking water and domestic water was abandoned as early as 1876-1878. And they moved and built a reservoir called Hesselgat Town, the river Kaveri, which then became the source of water and uh, continued to do so for a long, long time till the 1930s, using steam engine to bring water. So the relevance of tanks and lakes and city ecosystems has faced a challenge uh, as a drinking water supply from quite some time, from 120 years, and we should learn from that history, right? And we know that the cascading tanks, one feeding into the other, it's a natural hydrological construct. It's no genius of our ancestors, but the fact that the tanks themselves on their own cascade and then end up as uh, becoming uh, a river or a chain of tanks. Right? So some practical aspects of tank construction and, and how it went, went about. And now I just want to, just to show you and share with you some uh, figures, right? So, uh, and photographs. So here's the beautiful Arkavati River and it begins with a tank. <coughs> now, is a tank the first of the dams to stop the flow, natural flow of water in the rivers? Something that we have to ask ourselves, right? Because the protagonists of rivers and the free flow of rivers would, in theory, object to tanks being placed in them. These are the conflicts that are needed to be managed. But the tanks themselves are anthropocentric and serve the purpose of farming and agriculture, as I come to you. The ecosystem of the tanks also deals with rainwater, surface water, and groundwater, and of course, soil moisture. All four are connected. All four layers of water are connected, including atmospheric water, right? So the water vapor has to condense, fall as rain, and then cascade down the streams, and be dammed and become tanks, infiltrate the groundwater and become well water. And the soil moisture continues to be the provision for crops and for the crop growth. So when we look at tanks and lakes, let's look at all the layers of water, right? From rain to groundwater when we design or conceptualize it. So nice to see. So this is the kind of water spreads that human being have uh, human beings have made. To keep in mind that if you don't have a percolation tank and if you have a tank like this full of water in the hot arid climates, evaporation losses are stunningly high. 1.5 to 1.8 meters of water can evaporate in a year, whereas the tank depths are usually around that only. In nature, in regularly, tanks would dry up. So that was the nature of tanks. They were never full throughout the year. They would usually full for three to six months, something that we need to remember. 
and they were also silty at points of time. The silt was as appreciated as the water, because for agriculture you needed the silt for the paddy fields and for the command area to be fertilized well. So people welcome the silt and the water simultaneously. And once silt is no longer appreciated because we don't need it, we think that it's silting up our tanks and lakes. How do we deal with the system? Where do we dump the silt? It's kind of challenges that Vartur, Bellandur, and other places are facing because silt transportation then becomes a contracted business and it becomes really expensive. Yes, something to remember. The leak of the tanks and lakes with livelihoods. The fishing nets you see here are put by the fishermen, but the fishermen themselves introduce commercial fishing into it, they bring in the European carp and they bring in others and all the fishing activity now in our lakes is not natural fishing but commercial activity. So how do we imagine and deal with fishing and livelihoods in our tanks and lakes? Something to ponder over as we go ahead with this beautiful waters and you see the still waters for, uh, for fishing. And remember that fishing was in uh, challenge to the use of water by the agriculturists because the fishermen needed water in the tank, the agriculturists needed water in the command area and there was always a balance that had to be struck. You saw the construction of the bun, but this was also done sort of through local knowledge by shaping the bun in a particular fashion and making sure that it had this kind of uh, stone covers to prevent erosion, right, which was done naturally and that's the Kodi the overflow where, where the water overflows and you would have studied that and this was really, really uh, a grand uh, festival when the Kodi overflowed, when the waste layer had an overflow, like you see here, matter of great celebration as you saw that. But the level of the weir itself was a big challenge. How much of land would it submerge behind, right? How much of water should a villager hold on to and how much should the next village get waters? So tank weir construction and the height of this Kodi or this uh, waste weir it's a very elaborate exercise in rainfall patterns over 10, 20 years and the sharing of waters between upstream and downstream tanks. And it's no easy matter to arrive at the genuine height, right? Because you have to satisfy the demand of the village, but you have also to satisfy the demand of the downstream. How do we arrive at it? Big challenge even now, right? You would have talked perhaps about the Nirugantis, the people who distributed the water from the Dalit community who are responsible for understanding how much water is there in the tank and make sure that the water is distributed equally and equitably amongst all the command area people. And these are Nirugantis from a tank in Kolar. And the festival of Gangamma, which was part of the lake ritual annually, whenever the tank filled up, there would be a respect paid to the water goddess and she would be appreciated in the tanks, right? And this beautiful cultivation of paddy and sometimes people get upset that you're growing paddy in a dry arid area but tank uh, uh, were generally used for paddy cultivation they were not used for millets or for any other crops the command area of the tanks was used for paddy cultivation and there go, go glorious scenes even in kolar and chikbulapur if you go now lovely to see paddy fields like this and it, you know it's the imagination of a bali or a java when you see it these terrace fields are worthy of visiting and appreciating and seeing what's happening there. So, in a hard rocky landscape, water in plenty and paddy growing thanks to the tank irrigation system, it's a joy to behold. Though the gendered approach of labor, the kind of hard duty that women were forced to take is then again a social question as to whether we should encourage that or not encourage that and how should we deal with it, right? Women are essentially the major workers of the paddy fields, so gender question comes in. But then you see this rice uh, cultivation um, and uh, I mean, it's such a beautiful green site and then when it is ripening, right now if you go in some tanks of Kolar, you'll see the rice uh, ripening all over. If this is harvest time, um, IR64, you name it, Rajini, many varieties of rice grow there. The tank command area also needed hard rock places for the rice to be winnowed, right? And we sometimes don't think of it in that fashion now. But if you don't have that place, you cannot winnow the, winnow the rice and collect the seeds and take it across. And if it rains, then you have, you're in big problem when the rice is ripening. And the ecosystem of surface water, groundwater and paddy cultivation is a, I mean, it's such a wonderful sight to see in all these places. So when tanks have been desilted and rehabilitated, you've seen that groundwater tables actually reach ground level and artesian conditions, like in this well in a tank near in Malur. And this is from last year, 2020, right? The heritage of the tank was also the heritage of the well. Because the well provided the water for drinking uh, with those beautiful dry stone pitching and what you see there uh, as steps for you to go down and pick up the water. And this was drinking water coming in through filtration systems, which is earth as the filter and the tank was full in which it came here. So simply glorious. I mean, this tradition and architecture has been glorious. 
Tanks were also provide, probably, uh, providing water and uh, forage for those who did not own land. That was a key question. How would non-landowners benefit from a tank? So it provided drinking water for the shepherds and for the goatherds. And you always have to think when you're going to rehabilitate tanks and lakes in the rural context, how would the non-landless benefit? And they have to be inclusive about the non-landless. Right? And this rocky hillock I'm showing because panthers have come back or leopards have come back. If tanks are rejuvenated, biodiversity can also return. So there's a huge biodiversity angle to tank management. And community participation, drawing maps with villagers, identifying points of pain, points of problem. What needs to be addressed first? Where is the land being encroached? Where are the channels being encroached? These kind of maps which are created help the community to understand the entire catchment storage command area ecosystem as well as what the role of community should be in non-encroaching it and cleaning it up. Right? So these kind of ready-made maps should also be made and discussed with the communities even for urban lakes and urban tanks. I would like to just dwell upon this as part of the keynote to think of the 13 parameters for a well-developed tank ecosystem. This I'm taking from the World Bank Assisted Jal Samvardhanai scheme or program. We need to develop this kind of a parameters for assessment for urban tanks separately, but for rural tanks, this is glorious. Self-managed and sustainable tank users group. So tank users should own the tank and should take all decisions relevant to the tank, including how much water to be used for the command area and so on and so forth. At least 85% of the traditionally marginalized to be included as part, part of tank users group. Those who do not own land, those from the Dalit community, those from the gender community should be part of the tank users group. Inclusivity. At least 50% of farmers in tank command area increase production by 35% of baseline, right? So the direct benefit should be felt. Remaining 50% of the farm should increase by 25% of baseline, right? So baseline data and then how do you measure progress? These are all some of the parameters that come up. At least 75% of landless tank users increase income by 50% of baseline value. How do you do that? By transferring fishing rights to the non-landless and ensuring that the income from, the, from that and from tree planting and horticulture goes to the non-landless, you can uh, uh, ensure equity and equality, right? All TMIs, or tank management institutes, tank user groups have to have their plan approved by the local body, the gram panchayat in that case, or the ward committees in the urban case, right? The ward committees should be able to approve this. 75% have, should have tank management plan, including the collection maintenance plan. So these are evaluations. The technical and engineering component should be 100% approved, and then only then should the tank plan roll out. Irrigated area increased by 25%. 60% of the tanks are used for fishery activities. Water levels or surrounding wells, the impact on groundwater should be at least one and a half meters, and at least 60% of the farmers practice trouble cropping. So these kind of parameters we could also develop through community negotiated approaches for urban lakes too. But we should also remember this in the rural lake context because tanks are essentially social constructs or social creatures, right? And in the last point that I want to leave with you is that in the nutrient rich urban areas, what happens is all inland water bodies wants to become land. Inland water bodies fix carbon through algae, to macrophytes, to plants that grow inside them, fix it from the air, die, and build up the carbon level in the water body, unless they are maintained and desilted regularly. And especially in a nutrient-rich en uh, environment where phosphates and nitrates also come in from solid waste as well as sewage, these tanks become wetlands. Are we ready to accept them as not water bodies, but as green biodiversity space, which are doing the job of cleaning the water, but are full of diverse kind of native species of wetlands and native species of reptiles, mammals, and birds is something that we'll have to ask ourselves. Otherwise, we'll spend tremendous amount of energy and monies to keep them as water bodies. Yeah. So just wanted to share these brief thoughts with you. Thank you for listening in and good luck in your journey with all the knowledge that you have picked up and hopefully you will see positive interventions in our uh, ecosystem. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So I'll be inviting uh, Mr. Nagesh now to uh, talk about the way forward. Thank you, Shashank. Just to conclude, actually, uh, you know, uh, just a look back at the course. Uh, we had uh, 15 faculties covering 26 topics covered under 11 themes. Uh, what uh, Mr. Vishwanath actually talked about the, uh, the, the different lenses. Uh, fortunately, we have actually a, at least a, a couple of uh, sessions on each of those lenses. So I suppose uh, you people have got a very comprehensive idea about what is a lake and how to manage lake, how to rejuvenate lake. 
and uh, various uh, different uh, you know problems raised during that by different groups across the country and uh, so we had a very good time i hope and there are certain uh, you know going forward there are certain things which we would like to uh, do now that you have completed the course now you know what what after the course that question would have come to you uh, we are actually making a uh, freshly cut videos for all the subjects whatever was covered not only in this course but previous courses as well we are actually making a very comprehensive uh, framework of all the subjects and we will actually be mindful about these nine lessons which uh, mr vishwanath uh, talked about and uh, uh, frame them accordingly and we will make all these videos available on our website q and a so these will appear in our google classroom please do visit then uh, going forward all of you have actually individually uh, you know recruited yourselves right but uh, what we would like to have is make groups amongst yourselves uh, preferably locality based or you get associated with other uh, larger groups nearby uh, those who are far flung in the uh, country need not worry actually we will reach out to you and allow you to become uh, groups which which are associated with us and we will have regular exchange of ideas and you know if you have any doubts then we can uh, we will actually act as single point of contact for uh, getting your doubts cleared through you know the topmost experts in the country fortunately bangalore is actually very rich in such experts on various aspects of uh, you know lake management and rejuvenation so we can actually tap their talent to get you the right answers actually so this is what is uh, lies ahead and once you make a lake group uh, if you want to make lake groups then also we can help you out in you know uh, how to approach that uh, process itself and uh, you know we have several projects which are there in uh, you know pipeline uh, we will be making announcements so please uh, stay in touch thank you sir i will uh, invite dr anathullah to give the vote of thanks yeah thank you shashank so respected vishwana sir and our most valuable speakers participants ladies and gentlemen a warm and cherished good evening to all i hope you have you have all enjoyed the informative lake course it is my honor and privilege now to give you a vote of thanks to all those who helped make this course happen and to acknowledge the contribution of those who worked hard for successfully completing lake courses 2021 lake management and rejuvenation engineering or environmental standards and design principles i on behalf of friends of lake a tree ashoka trust for research in ecology and the environment water institute uvc bangalore university bangalore supporting team and on my behalf i extend a very heartly thanks to all our speakers for sparing their time gracing your important work and sharing with us your findings and recommendations finally i also thank everyone for their participation and their willingness to complete assignments and task beyond their comfort zone now you have learned and now what is more important is more than knowledge it is action which is most important so we hope there will be some action from these participants we once again we thank all of you and i thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity thank you all